You're listening to session number one of the Trailer Music Composers podcast. One man. One microphone. And one medium-sized coffee. Welcome to the Trailer Music Composers podcast. I often get asked um, by students... Uh, and friends, actually, you know, how did I get into trailer music? You know, it's it's a pretty niche job to be writing music specifically for film trailers. Um, and in this first episode, I just really wanted to give you guys an insight into my story and how I got to where I am. Uh, and for those of you who don't know me, where I am is uh, I'm a full-time uh, trailer music composer, uh, you know, I've won multiple awards and well, I say full time, I'm not full time. Uh, I do it a few hours a day, uh, you know, some days of the week. Uh, so I am incredibly blessed. Um, but I got here by working hard, uh, which is, you know, the same story of most successful people. Uh, but, you know, I, f- I find it really interesting telling people my story because uh, some people want to hear, have the magic bullet, you know. They want to hear that, uh, oh, you know what, I, I just I just phoned this one person and they got me a job. I landed a, like, 300 grand sink and I was done. It wasn't like that. Um, you know, I could go back and go, well, it all started back when I was two and I started playing with pots and pans. Uh, you know, obviously... I think I had a fascination with sound back then when I was two. Um, you know, I'm constantly showing that photo of me inside the pots and pans cupboard. And, you know, I'm quite happy to see that my kids go inside the pots and pans cupboard. So maybe they've got a fascination with sound too. Um, but, you know, I grew up listening to a lot of music. You know, when my mum wasn't sort of hammering out Lionel Richie and ABBA, we had film scores playing, uh, specifically Last of the Mohicans, you know, that one's stuck in my mind quite vividly, and uh, Michael Nyman's The Piano Film Score. So I had all this stuff sort of ticking away in my mind. Uh, and at the time, I, did, I you know, you don't really realise that that, you know, that you're you're soaking it up like a sponge, you know. At the time, you're like, oh, my goodness, would you turn that music off? I want to listen to the Smashing Pumpkins. Come on. Um, you know, which obviously the pumpkins are amazing and they have a huge part in my musical legacy. Uh, well, legacy sounds a bit pompous, but you know, musical, uh, vocabulary. Um, so yeah, I, uh, I grew up with lots of music going on and, uh, at some point I started learning the keyboard. Uh, I didn't, I don't think I got very far because practicing as a 10, 11 year old, uh, really wasn't on my radar. You know, I, I kept it up, uh, for a few years, uh, because I like my teacher, he was really nice, really enthusiastic. And, you know, I did like music. Uh, although, you know, at that point in my, uh, my musical taste was somewhere around Janet Jackson and Simply Red. So, you know, I, I, I can't vouch for my, my taste back then, but you know, the fact and the, the most important part of it is that I, I just listened to what I like and I did what I liked and that was really important. And then what happened was my older brother, he picked up a guitar and was like, Hey, uh, mum, I want to have guitar lessons. Can I have those please? And he started having guitar lessons. And, you know, obviously as the younger brother, I was like, my brother's so cool. I'm going to learn guitar too. So what I did was uh, when he was out, I'd sneak into his room and take his guitar and try and learn Smashing Pumpkins songs. Uh, and, you know, that was, in my mind, that was the huge turning point for me was when I started learning how to play the guitar. It was like, you know, firstly, the chicks are going to dig this. Uh, and secondly, I can play my favorite songs. You know, I, specifically, I remember playing Cherub Rock, uh, not the actual lead line. I had a little chord book that taught me the chords of it. And, you know, it was quite simple, you know, E's, A's and D's. So I was very, very happy. And I got my mum and brother up into the room and I was like, hey, guys, look what I can do. I'm basically a rock star. You know, I started jamming out. Um, and that progressed, you know, I, I play guitar all the time. I joined some bands uh, and I started writing my own stuff. You know, I didn't know how to do it. So I just had a little uh, tape recorder I picked up from a car boot sale, which I still have today. Um, and I just started playing music into it uh, and recording it. And, and that was my process. And then uh, my mum bought me a four track recorder uh, as a Christmas present one year. Uh, 
which was a bit beyond me, admittedly. I, I did manage to track out four guitar parts, but it was a real realisation that actually, you know, I can't play in time <laughs> at all. I can write nice parts, but I cannot play them together. It sounded like some kind of uh, strange uh, tape delay effect. Um, so yeah, that was... Uh, that passion for the guitar and be and, and music was stemmed hugely by Billy Corgan and the Smashing Pumpkins and by me and my friends being in a band together, you know, playing covers of Nirvana, Foo Fighters, uh, a small band called the Llama Farmers, you know, uh, and we absolutely loved it. We had a whale of a time. And, uh, as a result of that, you know, I got to that point when I think I was about 18. I thought, yeah, actually, I'm not sure whether I want to do what I want to do with my life. Uh, so I, I actually decided to enroll in an art course. Um, uh, don't worry, this actually makes sense when it comes back to it. So uh, I was in the band at the time and I think I was, I think we were, you know, we were, we'd all left school and we were all a bit like, uh, we don't want to do with ourselves. We took a year out to, to do the band, uh, but because none of us were particularly motivated to play live, we just ended up, um, uh, just practicing all the time, which was good. Um, uh, but, you know, meanwhile, I was at art college enjoying doing art and photography and illustration and stuff. And that was great fun. You know, I met my my wife there, um, you know, which was obviously magical. And then that was, for me, that was the reason to be there. Uh, and then uh, I decided to do a course uh, at a college called the ACM, which was a uh, Academy of Contemporary Music, which was kind of like, at the time, I thought what it would do would teach me how to play amazing guitar and, you know, be an amazing musician, uh, which it did, you know, it was it was absolutely huge for teaching me uh, oral skills, as, as in oral, as in AU, my, AU, my listening skills, uh, playing to a metronome, uh, all these things, they basically trained you as session musicians, which meant that after that year, I absolutely hated playing the electric guitar. I was so sick of it because they'd be like, you need to practice four hours a day, five hours a day. And you know, there's only so many times you can play your modes without being insanely bored. So because of the result, because of that, I was attracted to a course at a university in Brighton uh, that was called Music and Visual Art, uh, and it was it was a uh, it was a combination of music and art. And I thought, well, I did an art course last year. I'm doing a music course this year. Maybe this is for me. And uh, you know, and I had quite a stark realization that year that actually I didn't want to be in a band because playing live and playing with other musicians wasn't the thing that I enjoyed. The thing that I enjoyed was, sadly, sitting on my own, writing music. Um, and that's what I had been doing for years and years, doing that in my bedroom, just sitting and playing and writing music. Uh, and, you know, and at that point, I I had begun to realize the effect that film scores had on my life, uh, specifically at this point, Danny Elfman. So I started uh, listening to Danny Elfman scores uh, and trying to figure out, figure them out on the guitar. And I realized there was this whole world of writing that I didn't understand. So I signed up to this uh, university degree and I, luckily I got in, which was nice. Um, and I had a, an absolutely amazing tutor called Connell Gleason. He, uh, this was a, a bit of a fanboy moment for me. He w he did some orchestration on Star Trek: The Next Generation, and had worked in uh, the states as an orchestrator and was an amazing composer. And yeah, the the course was just wonderfully diverse. It taught you everything from using Max MSP and Logic to uh, writing music for installations and doing installations. So like I said, it was art and music, and you know we studied all these composers, we studied all these artists, we studied all these dancers. It was fantastic. It was the thing that laid the foundations for me of like, actually, uh, writing music, it, it doesn't have to be this really sort of anal three minute pop song where everything has to be done in a certain way. It can be weird and it can be wonderful. And it was, it was great. It, it really brought to me this passion for sound and exploring noises, you know, because some of the, some of the composers we listen to, you know, for instance, like the music concrete movement where, you know, it's just recording sounds and playing them out live and highlighting the crazy sounds that you are surrounded by every day. Um, I mean, that was amazing. Uh, and as a result, I, uh, I started to focus on writing music whilst I was at this, 
on this course and I realized actually I wanted to be a film composer. I wanted to write music for things like Danny Elfman, like John Williams, uh, like John Barry. Uh, and I just in completely immersed myself in film scores. Uh, you know, I would in the evenings, uh, whilst my, uh, my girlfriend was uh, doing her English literature reading, I would sit there with my headphones, listening to Debussy, reading the scores. And I really taught myself a great deal about writing by studying scores in the in, in the evening. And I had this little sort of workbook where I was, I had a, a, a section on orchestration. So I studied orchestration. I, I actually had, uh, I was lucky, lucky enough that my mum uh, was generous to pay for orchestration lessons with a local composer called uh, Rohan Krivacek, who was, oh, an, an absolutely amazing musician, um, specifically a sort of a, a Yiddish folk musician. And I mean, the stuff he had was, he played was amazing. And, you know, I'd walk into his, his studio, which was like this kind of dark hom homage to Tom Waits with all these wonderful foreign instruments hanging on the ceiling that I'd never heard before. And I'd sort of say, Hey, look, Rohan, I've written this. And he'd pull down this bizarre clarinet from some deep, deep dark area in Asia and say, well, how about this? And he'd play the line that I wrote on this instrument. And and the magic I felt when I heard him play my idea, it was just, yeah, I, I can't really tell you how, how magical that was for me. So I, yeah, like I said, I completely immersed myself in all this stuff, uh, all the while thinking, I'm going to be a film composer, I'm going to be a film composer. So I started approaching short film directors and all sorts of people just being like, Hey, uh, like I'm a composer. Can I write for your film? Uh, yeah, Hey, I'm a composer. Can I write for your dance troupe? So I did some dance pieces, which were amazing. And I did some short films, which, you know, weren't so amazing. Um, mostly because, uh, it was like, I was saying I'm a composer and I'm a film composer, but then I didn't have the first clue about producing music on a computer uh, I, I had dabbled in logic but that was the point where I said okay well I need to have a recording system at home so I got a grabbed a pirate copy of reason and cakewalk pro um, and that was when I started recording my own sounds and exploring production I didn't have a MIDI keyboard back then so I used to write all my all my MIDI parts in with a mouse uh, which at the time it seemed like magical because I'd gone from writing score where you'd spend however long with a pen and paper writing it down and then having to hit, hear somebody else play it. I could wait weeks for that to happen. But this, I could click a mouse and I'd hear the sound immediately. It was just magic. So it loved reason. Uh, Cakewalk Pro, I, I, I had my first experience in sampling with Cakewalk Pro. You know, I, I got my friend Hannah around. She played some violin notes for me and I layered them on Cakewalk Pro and it was... <clears throat> It was just wonderful. I loved that that part of my life. At that time of my life, it was it was all play. I I had this passion in in, and for, in my mind that I was going to be a film composer, and I just played around with the idea. Um, obviously, when I left university, it was a shock because I was like, you know, well, it wasn't a massive shock because me and my wife went travelling for uh, several months, which was yeah. You know, eye-opening and wonderful and amazing all at once. But when I got back, we were like, yeah, let's buy a house. And <clears throat> we'd saved up a tiny, tiny amount of money, bought a teeny little two up, two down. And I said, you know what? I'm going to make a go of this composition thing. Uh, and then after like two months of not hearing anything back from anybody, not getting any work or anything, I realized I was going to have to get a job. Uh, so <laughs> I got a job um, teaching music. And this was my career for uh, seven years, you know, teaching guitar. I used to teach African drums. I taught Basically, all the knowledge I had accumulated up to this point, I taught to children in schools. And I absolutely loved the job. And when I wasn't teaching, because it was only part-time teaching jobs, I was writing uh, and approaching companies about short films and all sorts, you know. And I was blessed that I managed to get some work writing corporate writing for corporate films and that was like this is amazing i'm getting paid to write music uh and that was again massive massive boost to my confidence and i just kept plugging away plugging away plugging away in the meantime one of my friends was doing a uh a show for a record label and they wanted some music like 24 like sean calories uh 24 music to walk on stage to you know like cool emotive music and uh 
And I did that. And the lead singer's girlfriend was working for a publisher called Boozy and Hawks. Uh, so she approached me and said, hey, send me in your demo reel. Uh, I do stuff for advertising. Uh, and uh, I started, you know, I sent I sent in like this CD of, you know, 50 of my, my greatest works. Uh, and she sort of emailed, emailed me back saying, hey, look, this one is fantastic. Let's get you in. So I came in there and signed up as a composer with them which was just epic. That was like, you know, I am going to be a composer, you know, I, this is going to be huge. Uh, little did I realize that actually in that world, in the advertising sync world, you don't get paid unless you get the job. So I was doing tons and tons of free work and that continued for years and years, pitching endlessly. Uh, but the great thing was I was just learning my craft, pitching, getting feedback, pitching, getting feedback all the while, increasing the amount of sample libraries I had increasing, uh, the speed of my working. I even got a MIDI keyboard. It was very exciting. Um, and then that continued. But whilst I was working there, I, uh, I was also producing my own music just for fun. Cause I thought, you know, actually I, I want to write my own stuff. So I did this stuff called Mr. Monocle's quirky delights, uh, which was me playing a ukulele whistling with a recorder. I think it was, um, and, uh, a young man there was called Vikram Goody. And, uh, he had just started at Boozy and Hawks and, you know, we got, got to talking. He, he said how much he loved my quirky, weird, um, ukulele tracks and we hit it off from there. And <clears throat> those of you who know me, you'll know that me and Vikram, me and Vic, uh, have a very successful working relationship now because he then set up the company Elephant Music, which I signed to. And, uh, you know, Vic was my big break, basically, you know, whilst I was teaching part time, I was sending tracks to Vic and Vic was starting to get me work that was paid. You know, I'd had one or two, I'd call them hits, you know, in, uh, speech marks hits. Um, you know, one was like a cheese advert, which actually paid amazingly. And that was like, yay, I earned some money. Uh, I can pay my way. And, you know, I, I think me and Vic, our first one was like a 500 pound sync for a Hewlett Packard online advert, which again was huge for us both. I think, I think that was our, both our first syncs together. So he set up elephant music and we, we, we were pitching for stuff. He moved over to, uh, LA for a little bit and came back and he said, you know what, Rich, uh, I just want some piano music. People are asking for piano music. Can you write piano music? And I said, Vic, I love writing piano music. I love it. So I wrote, I, I, it was at this time, I also stumbled upon Spitfire Audio. They had released, started releasing their labs, which then were donationware. So I donated two pounds or three pounds, whatever it was to buy there. It was called then the felt piano, but it's now called the soft yeah. piano. I downloaded the soft piano and I was so inspired by this weird and wonderful sound that I then wrote uh, five albums, 50 tracks in about three or four weeks. I sent them to Vic and he was like, oh, this is amazing. And he started pitching them all the while I was still teaching. I'd actually um, start upping my hours teaching because I, I was getting nervous that I wasn't going to get any more work as a composer. Then, uh, yeah, then Vic was pitching all this, this piano work stuff. And I was really proud of myself because I absolutely loved the albums, loved the sound. And then, uh, Vic suddenly sort of turned around to me and said, look, Rich, uh, I'm starting to do trailer work. So I'm going to start pitching your stuff for trailers and we're going to start producing trailer albums. And I want you to get on board. And I was like, great. I, I don't really know how to do trailers. I do a little bit, but, uh, great, let's do this. And, uh, and it was at this time as well, I was sort of saying to my wife, you know, I, I don't really want to do uh, teaching anymore. I want to be a full-time composer. That's what I feel like I'm supposed to be doing. I, I you know, I'm, I'm scared to leave because I don't have any money. I don't know what to do. And it was also the same time our, our daughter was born, Imogen. So she was, yeah, so it was about, she'd just been born. And I realized actually, you know, I want to be around my, when, when my daughter's little. So I decided to hand in my notice. Uh, teaching. And this is the wonderful thing about the universe. And you'll find out that I'm actually a, a bit of a, a, a beardy weirdy as my dad would call it, but, um, or crunchy, I think you call them in the States. Uh, the universe handed me something, uh, I handed in my notice and it felt like within a week, all of a sudden I got an email from 
but it was Ian Hawkes, who I still worked with at the time, um, saying, hey, this Japanese uh, film is being produced and they, they like your stuff and want you to score the film. And, and I was like, oh my gosh, I'm going to be a film composer. This is the dream. This is amazing. And actually scoring that film was one of the most wonderful experiences I've had in my musical career. It was fantastic. The easiest job I've had. They sent me a spreadsheet say of, of the track, you know, the track they wanted and what, so the track was the mood they wanted, the length of it and any other keywords to do with instruments or speed. I just wrote tracks based on that. They only gave me one change to make. And I think I wrote about 20 cues, like 60 minutes of music. Uh, and then as well as that, Vic finds me up and says, Rich, we just landed two IBM adverts uh, and it paid, uh, I think they paid really well, actually. I think in total I got 15 grand, uh, which was like, oh my gosh, that's my next year's mortgage. I've got a safety net for a year. So it was like, yes, I put this money aside. I, I handed in my notice at the same time I, and everything just fell into place and from there, I just started, I, I, I was still working with lots of other companies, so um, as well as Vic, because I've always been told, you know, diversify yourself because this, that, and the other. <clears throat> Over time, uh, mine and Vic's relationship just got better and better, working relationship, that is, uh, and he just started getting more and more work, and I realized, you know, is it Pareto's Law? I forget what it's called, the 80-20 principle, like 80%, in fact, 90% of my income was coming from Vic, but it was only 20% of the time I was working, so I kind of just left everybody else and just started working with Vic, um, and that's where my days kind of changed to me and my wife uh, sharing our days, and because I wasn't working as much, I didn't, I was earning well and I decided you know me and my wife are going to share the childcare so we'd split the days between us and uh, that's pretty much how it has been since uh, my daughter was one so that's sort of five years ago um, and in those five years my career has absolutely rocketed you know I've won I think up, up to date eight awards uh, uh, you know I get regular trailers I, I mean Usually it's between two and four or five a month as, as I speak, which is, uh, where are we? November 2019. So my career is absolutely amazing. And, uh, and what happened as I started to get successful, you know, and I started to get some money, this was very exciting. Oh, I can actually buy a car that's not 17 years old. <coughs> so what I did was, uh, People kept asking me, Rich, how do you do what you do? Uh, and I, at first I was like, oh, you know, yeah, hard work, you know. Uh, and then people kept pestering me. So I said, look, okay, I'll show you. I went around to a friend's house and I showed him what I do. I was like, you know, this, that and the other. And I sort of laid out a trailer queue. And he was like, whoa, that's blown my mind. So I thought, oh, maybe there's something in this. Um, so I, I decided to message a few of my friends and... Uh, Composer friends that is in space say like, hey guys, I'm going to write a course. Will you pay me to write the course? So they all chipped in uh, a nominal fee as like a kick up the kick up the backside for me to actually do the course. So I wrote uh, this course called the Trailer Music Course, and um, the course basically kind of taught people all the ins and outs of trailer music. Uh, you know, from worms to rises to structure to mixing and mastering. And I was very, very lucky to uh, have Toby Mason to agree to do a mixing and mastering masterclass at the end of that course as well. It's great. And uh, here I am today. I have the Trailer Music School, which is where I have uh, students studying all the courses that I have produced in writing trailer music. Uh, I get trailer placements regularly. Uh, and then, and it's not just one style of music either. That's a wonderful thing. I'm not just doing epic. I'm doing, you know, uh, stomp swagger drums. I'm doing sort of delicate piano. I'm doing uh, dark sound design. I'm doing sort of thriller organic strings. It's a wonderful world to be working in, trying to music. You can be as creative as you like, as weird as you like, because there's going to be a film that's going to use that music. If you watch 
all the trailers on Apple on the Apple trailer site or Joe Blow trailers, whichever one you watch, you will notice that actually trailer music isn't just epic music. Trailer music spans all of the genres, all of the styles, and you can be very successful if you understand the structures and the formulas, um, which I feel like I do. Uh, so yeah, and here I am today, sat in my uh, sat in my study, uh, recording this first session of the podcast, which uh, my students at the Trailer Music School have been asking, saying, you know, Rich, we'd like a would like. There's no podcasts for trailer musicians. I thought, actually, there isn't. You know, I have a YouTube channel that shows people sort of how to write what I do, how to do what I do, and uh, and then obviously I have my Trailer Music School, which is more in depth, kind of. Uh, kind of group coaching, you know, teaching people to get better. And then if they do get better, then uh, I help them produce an album and we pitch it to uh, trailer companies, usually with Vic, uh, Mammoth or Elephant. So it's gone amazingly and uh, and hence the podcast. And this this podcast for me is, is going to be not like a diary of a trailer composer, but something, something along those lines, more like... Uh, Thoughts that I can't express on video. Uh, well, I could express them on video, but, you know, I, a talking head for me isn't, you know, the most exciting. And I love podcasts. Going for a walk in the woods with my with my, um, my now three-month-old, I'll be listening to podcasts. Uh, driving in the car, podcasts on. So it'll be nice for me to deliver content to you guys who are on your commute, who are going for your runs, doing a bit of shopping, doing a bit of ironing, and want to want to keep studying, keep learning about trailer music. So I will be delivering content about trailer music through this podcast. And in this episode, I talked about how I got to where I am. You know, there are obviously things I missed out, um, not on purpose, just because I don't think uh, you want to be uh, dealing with all the minor details, but the, the general shift of, you know what, it was a side hustle for me for seven years uh, before I went full time. That's not always the case, you know. My friend Kieran Birch did it much, much quicker. Uh, he was very, very focused, uh, and his writing is very niche as well. And he's an incredibly talented guy. So your story might be different. Your story might be like, "Hey, uh, did your course, Rich? In fact, some of my students have been like this. They did my course. They sold a track. Boom! They are now composers." Um, which has been amazing. So, so if you can learn anything from my story, it's this. Focus on the things you enjoy. Don't spend too much time doing the things you don't enjoy. Because what you're trying to do is you're trying to play to your strengths. The moment I play to my strengths was the moment I started to become more successful. And that's what you need to do follow your enjoyment okay so if you enjoyed this episode please subscribe to the channel and you can always pop on over to the trailer music school where you can read the show notes for this podcast as always thanks so much for listening and take care